good evening all of you uh, so i'm dr chitra babu and as vice chair of acm india chennai professional chapter it is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this 12th talk in the 50 years of touring award talk series and today's talk is on the contributions of 1986 touring award winners robert tarjan and john hopcraft they both received their touring award for the fundamental achievements in design and analysis of algorithms and data structures they came up with the very first efficient order of n algorithm for planarity testing in graphs and apart from that each one of them have contributed immensely independently and we will hear more about that from the speaker professor venkatesh raman and uh, for this crowd i i don't think i need to introduce professor venkatesh raman but i uh, will still do dr venkatesh raman is currently a senior professor and the uh, uh, at the imsc he has been with imsc for 27 years he received his phd from university of waterloo ontario canada before that he received his masters in mathematics in combinatorics and optimization from the same university and his msc in mathematics from iit kanpur his research interests are parameterized complexity and exact exponential time algorithms succinct space efficient data structures algorithms for satisfiability sorting selection and related problems and uh, uh, he is currently uh, vice president of acm india and also in the curriculum committee of the cs pathshala initiative which aims to bring high quality cs education in schools please welcome professor venkatesh raman thank you okay thank you chitra for this opportunity um so i'm going to be talking about contributions of hopcraft and uh, tarjan mostly about tarjan actually because it was initially going to be a talk on tarjan until we realized that both of them jointly won and then i decided to talk a bit more about hopcraft as well uh so this is hopcraft and that's tarjan and as uh, chitra mentioned the turing award citation 86 mentions that they get this award for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of algorithms and data structures <coughs> So the work being referred here actually appears in the PhD thesis of uh, Tarjan, and it's, so it's not often that a PhD thesis wins a Turing Award. Um, but Tarjan actually never fails to mention modestly that uh, he was there at the right time at the right place. You know, several other people deserved this. So to understand this, I will. in the first few minutes take you to the place and time in which this work happened so i'll we'll start with hopcraft who is the older of the two is about 10 years older than tarjan he's going to be about 80 next year he did his bachelor's from seattle university and masters from stanford in 1962 all in electrical engineering and phd in electrical engineering from stanford in 1964 <coughs> and he was all ready to get back to some university in stanford uh, in the west coast to some electrical engineering department until uh, a person named edward mcclusky uh, played a big role in bringing uh, hopcraft to princeton okay um so this actually you know changed the career of hopcraft and probably changed the the field of computer science as well right um so mcclusky is a big shot in uh, electrical engineering and he was uh, heading the computer digital systems laboratory in princeton he was looking to recruit people for his computer science department so he was spending you know spreading word at stanford looking for a uh, right set of people and landed up with talking to hopcraft so at that time hopcraft has done just one computer science course in uh, with huffman so the fact that he has done only one course with huffman didn't matter to mcclosky and the fact that 
McCluskey is an electrical engineer inviting him to begin the career of computer science department didn't matter to Hopcroft. Both of them met. They were impressed with each other about the commitment of computer science uh, each other had. And so Hopcroft took the job and joined Princeton. And then the next shock at Princeton was that he was asked to teach a course on automata theory by McCluskey. You know, remember that Hopcroft has just done one course with Huffman on combination of digital circuits, a little bit of theory of computing, coding, various things. So he asked McCluskey for, okay, is there some material or books, something available uh, which I can use? And McCluskey suggests a list of six papers. Okay, so again, two electrical engineers uh, talking about the vision of computer science and automata theory. And the six papers McCluskey suggested are these six papers. There's one by McCulloch and Pitts, which um, actually was something about some neurophysiology work. Um, in some sense, they've trying to model, capture strings that come out of some uh, electrical pulses and they ended up this notion of uh, regular expression. And you probably know about all of the other papers. Rabin and Scott, um, who discovered finite automata non-determinism, and they also proved that this language is accepted by this machine they developed is exactly what these guys came up with. Uh, Backers and Knorr and Chomsky and Turing and Hartmann is in Stian's paper. So Hopcroft mentions, you know, the, the, the diverse fields in which these people worked. Um, uh, Backers and Knorr were trying to come up with some formalism to specify programming languages, whereas Chomsky was a linguist and, you know, he was trying to come up with some formal ways of grammar and it turns out both of them ended up some, you know, with some similar ideas. Turing um, had this famous paper on computability and uh, again Hopcroft says that Turing's paper would have become uh, just a paper on logic and computability until Hartmannes and Steens picked it up and defined complexity classes based on this Turing machine. Right? So these six papers were suggested by McCloskey and Hopcroft picked them up, read them up and um, offered this course on automata theory and languages. He wrote this book with uh, Woolman in 1969, so it's about close to 50 years and it still, you know, stands the test of time. It's just, uh, you know, covers all these material and um, defined this whole field. So this is the birth of, you know, the whole field in the mainstream computer science uh, departments. In fact, the whole the reason he was asked to teach the course on automata theory was at that time the computer science courses were largely about combinatorial circuits, you know, digital circuits. You want to build circuits to minimize the number of transistors and so on. And Hopcroft says, you know, the technology was developing so fast that minimizing transistors was not such an important problem. You know, people are moving into chip technology where they can pack a lot of different processors. So all computer science department, whatever little that existed at that time were having this existential crisis of, oh, we need to teach something different. And um, so Hopcroft gave this solution, right? Thanks to, again, McCloskey. So this book now, I, you know, many of you would have seen and um, uh, so nicely written and uh, we all learnt from this book and it had multiple editions and uh, thus, um, you know, Hopcraft and Woolman won this John von Neumann medal from IEEE for this, uh, you know, defining this field. And, you know, during the course of running this lectures. He also had some seminar series where he invited Hartmannus and Hartmannus was looking for people at, uh, to develop computer science at Cornell and he was asking for, you know, are there good PhD students and Hopcroft says, what about me? Can I come? And uh, so Hartmannus 
invites him, so he moves to Cornell and has been there since 1967. Okay. So, after establishing this course on automata theory and he wanted to move to algorithms and develop a science of algorithms as he says and he moves on a sabbatical to Stanford in 1972. So, this Turing Award work with Tarjun happens at Stanford in 1972. Okay, so, now um, Tarjun does his B math at Caltech 1969. He was always interested in uh, math. He gets his master's from Stanford in 1971. Knuth was his course advisor and uh, you know, Tarjan wanted to do something in AI, but Knuth had other plans. He wanted him to read his book on uh, fundamental algorithms. And um, he was actually supervised by Bob Floyd, but he works with Hopcroft, who came on a sabbatical from Cornell. And his PhD thesis was on an algorithm to determine whether a graph can be embedded in a plane without edges crossing each other. And um, he came up with a linear time planarity algorithm that won him the Turing Award. But it's not just the algorithm, but along the way they laid a lot of foundations. Um, so, but so before I get to what he did, let me also tell you what, how was algorithms research at that time. Knuth's Fundamental Algorithms books was released. Um, <clears throat> that was mostly about, you know, sequences, numbers. And asymptotics was only for, you know, computing some summation of series or something, right? And Knuth's style of analyzing algorithms, he would, in his mixed language, he would analyze every little step and he would say, you know, n this many steps and n square of this steps, that many this steps, and he will add that big thing. And this was not very satisfying for Hopcroft and Tarjman for the kind of problems they wanted to look at. So, there were this Turing machine algorithms. Um, we had Cook 1971 paper has come on um, NP completeness, CARP, Edmonds, they were all talking about polynomial time algorithms as a notion of feasible algorithms. But again, these guys, Hopcroft and Tarjan, were interested in you know, very low level n square, n log n linear kind of algorithms. And so, they needed some way of measuring some model. Most papers on algorithms at that time had, you know, usually a program and some table of results, some, some graph comparing with some other algorithm, again, some other program, some other input. And um, so often it was not very satisfying whether the algorithm improved it or whether the, you know, whether the developers were better program designers or the operating system improved, so it was not very clear. Graphs and algorithms were there, uh, mostly in the AI world. They were all, anal I know, graph search methods were there, but um, there was no systematic analysis. So, this is the time where uh, they wanted a good model and way of analyzing algorithms. And the problem they chose to look at was to test whether a graph can be embedded in a plane. Right? So, Again, for planarity, there were some algorithms. There was this uh, nice theorem due to Krotowski, which says that a graph is non-planar if and only if it has what is called a subdivision of a complete graph and five vertices or a complete bipartite graph with three vertices on each part. But any algorithm using this would result in something like an n power 6 kind of an algorithm. Um, there were other algorithms known about, you know, you find a cycle in the graph, delete it, and then recursively check for plan planarity of the remaining pieces, and you need to deal with different pieces conflicting with the cycle, one side, the other side, there were these things, but they were not really well analyzed. In fact, one such algorithm was getting into an infinite loop, according to Tarjan. There was no theoretical analysis, and this is the time when uh, Hopcroft and Tarjan started working on uh, this planarity algorithm. So, the first thing they, their contribution, which again, as uh, 
tested, uh, stood the test of time, is this random access model of computation, moving away from Turing machine where you have this you know, sequence of cells where a, a program can access any cell in constant time. You can do certain computations in constant time. And they wanted to analyze algorithms using this big O notation. Big O notation was there, but you know, using that to analyze algorithms was the first, in fact, the first uh, linear in Tar Hopcroft Tarjan's paper is where you can see this first um, discussion on that we are going to ignore the constant factors and things like that. And the other thing is this worst case running time is what we want to look at. They thought about average case, but you know the, the typical input may not be, you know, you may not be able to measure the distribution of the typical input. So they gave up on different other ways of measuring and they settled on worst case. So to me, the, the big contribution is this RAM model analyzing this algorithm using this big O notation and worst case running time as the measure in which we want to analyze algorithms. And then they were looking for a, a order n algorithm, but you know, if you represent your graph as an adjacency matrix, then you can't avoid an n square, you know, even to just scan and look at, look for edges. So they came up. I mean, it is not that they came up with, but they identified that adjacency list is a better representation for a graph in this case. Planar graphs are sparse, so they only have linear number of edges. So looking for an order n algorithm is realistic, and we will use adjacency list. So formally analyzing and recognizing adjacency list as an important representation for graph is one of their contribution. And then they were actually implementing the old algorithm of finding a cycle and removing it and recursively looking at the pieces and trying to embed them. But they needed to look at these pieces in a very systematic way and towards that they, they recognize a depth first search which you know we all I mean both the two items we all take things for granted but this was the uh, their contribution of recognizing depth first search is an important paradigm. In fact, Tarjan wrote several papers, you know, to find all biconnected components, to find bridges in a graph, triconnected components, and various things in linear time using depth first search. And it was very important that you actually explore your graph using depth first search to get linear time algorithms for this. Yes, and then, you know, uh, so using depth first search and all, the, they needed uh, a lot of little tools and uh, they obtained the linear time algorithm for planar testing and along the way they also managed to show that you can test for two plane isomorphism of two planar graphs in uh, linear time. Okay, so these papers appeared in uh, JACM 1974, SAM Journal of Computing 1972, 73, JCSS. Okay, so that's the uh, you know, Turing Award work which laid the foundations of how algorithms are analyzed, how graphs are represented, some nice techniques, tools, and so on. So after that, uh, you know, the path of Hopcraft and Trajan sort of uh, diverged a bit. The learning from this work for Torsion was that data structures play an important role in design of algorithms. So he spent a lot of time on data structures. And Hopcroft was into, you know, science building, right? He settled science of comply automata theory, science of algorithms, and he moved on to different areas. So let me just, um, so Hopcroft went back to Cornell and uh, developed this course on algorithms there and he wrote this book design analysis of computer algorithms along with Eho Ullman again another classic book um, many of the topics that are there are you know continue to remain as the topics for the first algorithms course they had another edition um, not quite on the same book but 
they called it data structures and algorithms that was uh, in 83 and more recently uh, you know he has also written a book on foundations of data science so this this tells you that okay and so the the real you know noteworthy work of hopcraft in algorithms i would say is uh, this hopcraft carp algorithm for finding maximum matching in bipartite graphs but basically he moved on to complexity theory algorithm geometry robotics social networks ai deep learning and everywhere is more motive is to sort of clean up the area set some foundations and that is the mode in which he was working okay so um he became an acm fellow in 1994 along with tarjan uh, along with wulman he won this john von neumann medal for his um field defining books on algorithms and automata theory an impressive list of about 30 students yes so i'm going to drop hopcraft from now on and move to tarjan okay, okay so um hopcraft continues work in whole bunch of areas and i'm not too familiar with them and um but he's still very active and he is you know as i said he's written a book on data science now okay tarjan um went to cornell i guess hopcraft uh, would have invited him soon after his phd but he moved between east and west and between industry and um, universities and he spent time at uh, various places currently he's at princeton he won the first nevan lina prize which is given by the international congress of mathematicians um he became acm fellow he he got this paris canalakis award which is given for some theoretical work which has a significant value in practice so this is for his work on splay trees about which i'll get to towards then and he has produced about 26 students so in terms of contributions of tarjan he went on to uh, work on a number of areas in algorithms and data structures again most of it become part of our mainstream first course in algorithms right so, um he has his name on this linear time algorithm for finding the median of a list so at that time it is 1973 we know that we can sort in n log n time and we can find the smallest second smallest and towards the end you know linear time but if i want to find the median of a given list can you do better than sorting was a big open problem and uh, along with bloom floyd pratt and rivest um i think everybody except prat is a turing award winner so it required so many big shots to come up with a linear time algorithm which we teach in our first course on algorithms but again this is a a classic example of a divide and conquer algorithm technique and uh, yeah tarjan had his mark in it and he has worked on you know anything else we teach in our first course about uh, network flows um spanning trees um you know he has for example so you can see that he was actually always looking for linear time algorithms right uh, linear time median finding linear time spanning tree linear time network flows and um, yes along with klein and karger he has a linear time algorithm randomized for minimum spanning trees for example okay yeah. i 80s is on sometime in 80s in fact it even appears in carmen's book um you know the ford fulkerson way of algorithms is classic but tarjan had a different way of uh, doing network you know max flow algorithm so he stands out actually a lot more for his contributions in uh, data structures um you know when when it 
came to planarity algorithm, graph algorithms. Worst case was the measure they chose, but uh, he realized that when we were analyzing um, complexity of algorithms on data structures, uh, amortized complexity is a better measure. I will have, I will spend actually more time on amortized complexity later, so I will get to that later. Now this actually opened up a whole lot of things um, in terms of designing data structures, keeping amortized complexity in mind rather than worst case. Um, he has a very, you know, this is probably one of the complicated analysis we do in the first algorithms course is this analysis of this union fine data structure, you know, which has suddenly inverse Ackerman function coming in there. Um, he designed various self-organizing data structures, splay trees. I will spend more time on splay trees and amortized complexity later. He was looked at with some one student this notion of persistent data structures where you want to maintain uh, you know, history of, so you want to maintain versions of different data structures, you want to be able to insert and delete and access some old version of a data structure and how efficiently can we maintain, how fast can we support these queries was this. Um, data structures maintain a forest of trees and he also has a, stands out as efficient data structure to support <coughs> you have a you know you have a tree and given a pair of vertices in the tree you want to find the least common ancestor so what sort of enhancement you need to do to to, to the tree to support this operation fast okay so he has um, a linear space data structure to do this he also wrote a book data structures and network algorithms um, this is siam 83 um, so what do I have? Yeah, so that, that is sort of my half an hour summary of um, both their contributions. Both of them are very active, um, continue to, you know, it, contribute um, in their own fields. So what I'm going to spend in the next about 15, 20 minutes is to take a little deeper into Tarjan's work on amortized complexity, splay trees, and in particular, there is a, an open problem, dynamic optimality conjecture. So again, we, you know, many of this is teach, taught in the first or second course in algorithm. Some of you might have taught, and so you may know this, but hopefully you will get something new here. Okay, so let's start with what is a typical data structuring problem, right? So you have, you're given some data, it could be a sequence, set of numbers, some graph, you want to organize it somehow, and you want to organize it based on the kind of queries you're going to do on that set, right? Depending on the queries, you will organize it differently, and this is, this is a typical data structure problem, right? So for example, you want to organize a set of numbers so that you want to be able to search whether some number is in that list or not, then the best way to organize it is sort of keep it sorted, right? I know, that's the way a dictionary is organized or that's the way some set of telephone numbers will be sorted so that you can quickly do what is called a binary search on this sorted array and you can get your, you know, whether a number is, element is there or not in logarithmic time. But suppose you also want to do insert operation. If it's not there, you want to insert. But let's say I don't care about search, but I only care about, I want, you know, imagine you have some jobs coming into a printer or a, a processor where jobs are coming with some priorities. So you want to insert this job into this queue. And at every point of time, you want to take the job with the maximum priority to be allotted to the processor. Then how do we represent this? What sort of data structure would we use this? If I want to support insert and delete max? Priority queue, okay, what, what data structure would you? Binary heap, okay, good. Okay. So you want to keep the elements in a heap so that the queries can be answered in logarithmic time. If you want to, you know, do insert, search, delete, all these operations, then 
um, a simple array will not be able to, you know, you won't be able to support in logarithmic time, but the data structure to do that would be a balanced binary search tree. Again, I'll tell you what it means. All times are worst case, right? We want to measure this. Now, this data structuring problem comes up in two kinds of applications. In one, maybe that is the problem. So, for example, you know, you want to organize all the keywords and all the websites so that when I give you a query, I want to be able to give you, you know, get the top thousand websites that match this. This is exactly what Google does. And you want the queries to be answered fast. So the worst case running time is important. Right? So you want to organize something and given a query, you want to be able to get the answer fast. This is one kind of application where uh, this data structuring problem comes up. The other kind of application is in trying to implement some graph algorithm or some other algorithm where repeatedly certain queries are asked and you want to be able to you know, support these queries. But in this case, the answer for one query is not very important because in the algorithm, so let's, if you take the algorithm of shortest path due to Dijkstra, then you know, it repeatedly keeps some approximate shortest paths and then it will delete something smallest, and it does some updates, and then it will delete something smallest, and so on. So it does repeatedly a set of queries. And so if I want to measure the efficiency of the algorithm, the time for one query is not that important, but I care about the time for a sequence of queries. right? So, and this is where, this is exactly what amortized complexity is, that you want to amortize over a sequence of operations. I don't care necessarily about the worst case running time, but I care about the time for a overall sequence of operations. So amortized cost is basically, you look at the cost for a sequence of some M operations, divide by M, that's the average, over all sequences for large enough M. Clearly, amortized cost is less than or equal to worst case cost because if I want to care about the total time for a sequence of operation, I can look at the worst case cost of any single operation and multiply by the length of the sequence. That will be the total cost, right? But often that can be an overestimate and you want really a tight estimate, right? So my favorite example is this, that if I want to find out your monthly expenses, right? So I ask you, Tell me how much you spend on any single day. And you tell me, oh, on the fifth of the month, I paid my rent 20,000 rupees. So I multiply by 30 and say, OK, your monthly expenses is at most 6 lakhs. Right? Or maybe in the modern world, you say, I paid my credit card bill, which was like 40,000 rupees on a day. And so you multiply by 30 and say, it's you know, 12 lakhs or whatever. So, Clearly, that's an overestimate, and the reason you pay something very high is to amortize your cost so that you don't have to pay it daily, right? So, so this, this is the idea of amortized cost, where you want to measure the time for an overall sequence of queries rather than a single query. And so the motivation is clear that you know this expensive operation of you spending 20,000 rupees every day is not going to happen very often. And in fact, expensive operation is typically followed or preceded by a, a sequence of cheap operations that you can distribute this cost over these operations. But the challenge is, okay, so here is a, another example. Suppose I want to increment a k-bit counter. Okay? So I have a k-bit counter, and my algorithm is to increment this k-bit counter. So a typical increment algorithm will just look at, you know, look at the sequence of ones at the end, change them to zero, and change the first zero to one. Right? You're just trying to do increment of a binary counter. You follow through the sequence, start from the end, change all the ones to zero, and the first zero you encounter, change it to one, and you stop. So in the worst case, the algorithm's running time could be as bad as k, because it could be you know zero one 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 one, and you you will increment it, change it to one zero 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 zero. So you might spend some k time, but 
how often you're going to spend this k time, right? So in fact, if you carefully analyze it, you will see that the last bit is flipped every time. You know, so suppose I'm doing, starting with 0, 0, 0, 0, I'm doing a lot of these increment operations. The last bit is flipped every time, but the, the one, the bit before is flipped only half the times. The bit before is flipped only one quarter of the time, and if you analyze it this way, you will see that the amortized cost will, will be only two. Okay? So again, worst case for a query can be an overestimate when you really care about the total time for a sequence of operations. So the challenge is to capture this interdisciplinary you know, inter interdependence of these operations. That, ah, here is an expensive operation, and how it's going to affect the future operation, how do you model this, and so on. And this is where Slater and Tarjan came up with this nice, you know, banking methodology or a potential methodology to, to compute this amortized cost. So each operation in your sequence comes with some sort of a charge. Okay, that is the amortized cost I'm given to that operation. And if I need more, if I, if I use less, I will put the remaining excess charge in the data structure for some other operation which needs more to take it. Take it. Right? So if you use less, keep the excess in the data structure, and if you use more, you draw from the data structure, then at any point the charge in the data structure is the non-negative potential in the data structure, and the charge with the operation is its amortized complexity, which is also the same as the actual cost minus the potential difference. So, so Tarjan brings this, you know, Slater and Tarjan potential, which is sort of this physicist's view, or some credit and charge, which is the banker's view, and there are various ways of analyzing this overall cost, where somehow we are distributing the cost over all the operations, and um, and this is, you know, so for example, for incrementing a k-bit counter, every operation will come with a charge of two to show that the amortized cost is two. And we will have the potential, which is the number of ones in the string. So whenever my increment operation takes a long time, ones are changed to zero, so the potential drops from the data structure. Okay, so net net Slater and Tarjan came up with this nice way of, you know, define the amortized complexity. Came up with how to do this and discovered their own data structures where some simple data structures that had pretty good amortized complexity, even though they had, you know, bad worst case complexity. So as a spin-off, there were you know, many data structures were reanalyzed and some tight bounds were obtained. More simpler data structures were designed keeping amortized complexity in mind. And it also explained some uh, practical heuristics about which maybe I'll tell you later. Um, yes, so now, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'll explain the last two bullets in little more detail as we move on. Okay, so any, any questions? Um, so quickly, it has actually moved into technical because I think that's all I'm going to spend time on. Um, I've done my story part of, part of their contribution, that's it. Okay, so let me now just get to this uh, splay trees, which are also called self-adjusting trees, which is an alternative to balanced binary search trees. Again, you know, this is, you know, been around for long. Many of you will be knowing this, but let me go over it for the sake of one or two people who may not have known this. Okay, so now I have to get back to this notion of binary search I talked about. If you have a, a sorted array, we know that we can search for an element in logarithmic time, but if I want to insert an element, let's say I want to insert three into this array, I can find where to insert it, but to actually execute the insertion will require moving all these elements to the right one position, so that will result in uh, linear time. So a solution is to this, this notion of binary search tree, 
where you actually model this binary search in the form of a two-dimensional uh, tree. So 90, for example, is the first element with which you will compare to check for your element. So that becomes the root of the tree. And um, 13 is the root of the left subtree and so on and so forth. So now any search would follow through the tree from the root to a leaf. Either you will find the element or you will, so, so suppose I am looking for 7, I will compare it with the root and I know that 9, if at all is there, would be in the left subtree, I will compare it with 13. If at all it will be there, it will be in the left subtree. So the property here is that it is a binary tree, means that it is a root and every node has at most 2 children. And anything to the left is smaller than the node which is smaller than anything to the right. And this property is satisfied for every node. And so if you do not find the node, the search will also tell you where it should be. So you can go and insert 9 that node, which was a problem to do in an array because it needed moving everybody around. But here you do not need to. So you, you seem to have managed to do insertion also in logarithmic time, but not quite, right? Why not? Just, you know, just to see whether you are all up. So I am just following binary search. The height of the tree is log n, so I would just go and find the location where I have to insert and I will insert that node. So why is it not good enough that have I solved my problem of supporting insert and switch search queries in logarithmic time? Why not? Hmm? If the input is in increasing order, yeah, I will take the median and create my binary search tree. So it will be balanced. Okay. So it's it's sort of dynamic. So if I now insert another element, let's say 5 and then 3 and 1 and so on, quickly this whole tree can degenerate into an unbalanced tree. So I have not really solved this problem of being able to insert in logarithmic time. So in particular, subsequent insertions into the binary search tree can make the tree unbalanced, resulting in linear height and hence linear time for insertion and search. So the solution proposed is what is called you know, balanced binary search trees, where you, for every node, you maintain a certain kind of a balance information. And whenever insertion causes that violation of that constraint, you do some rotations to fix it. Right? So maintain some local balance criteria. For example, ABL trees have this criteria that for every node, the height of the left subtree and the right subtree difference is at most 1. And that ensures logarithmic height. And whenever an insertion causes violation of this criteria, we will fix that using what are called rotations. Okay? We will get to what rotations are. And so the drawback of the balanced binary, I mean, this, this, this is fine. It works fine. And you can support all the required operations in logarithmic time. But you end up using some additional space to maintain this balance criteria. Um, your insertion anal algorithms are usually pretty involved, goes through a whole lot of case analysis. And, um, <clears throat> but there are, you know, really several versions of balanced binary search trees. And at least something like B trees are really used in databases in practice. Okay, so what, okay, I, I should tell you what rotation means. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So whenever you have the tree on the left, you want to right rotate at the node Y, you create the tree on the right. So Y becomes a child of X and the subtrees end up at the right positions. The nice thing is that you can implement one rotate in some constant number of pointer changes and you still maintain this property of binary search tree that anything to the left is smaller and anything to the right is larger and so on. Okay. So balanced binary search trees essentially ensure that this local criteria is satisfied by using these rotations and ensure that all everything can be done in 
logarithmic time. So what Slater and Tarjan came up with is that um, no, I'm not going. I'm going to do these rotations, but in very carefully controlled kind of rotations. One, and it doesn't matter. You know, there are no local balance criteria. I'm not going to remember anything. You know, depend after every axis, every insert. You know, I'm going to do these rotations and fix somehow the tree, but in in some controlled way, and it's independent of the shape of the tree. And it turns out, I'll tell you what display operations uh, may be. It turns out that somehow automatically it cuts the depth of the axis path, notes at the depth of the axis path by a factor of two, and in, you know, it sort of self adjusts the tree. And they proved that the amortized complexity of what they came up with is actually log n on starting with any tree on n nodes, even though the worst case could be linear. Okay. So, I am not sure I want to spend time on what splaying means, but it's, you know, essentially, if I want, so after accessing a node, I would just look at its parent and grandparent, and depending on the shape of the tree, which could be on, you know, any one of these, you know, there may not be a grandparent, which is the last case, or in any one of the two cases, I will do some rotations to get to the right side tree. But the element which you have accessed actually moves towards the root. Okay. So eventually you do these rotations and if you do this kind of carefully, then it turns out that, so for example, um, if this is a tree and you splay starting at A, you will get this one step of splaying, another step of splaying would get you to the, the third tree there, I don't think this pointer works. But you can see that this path has now become sort of balanced uh, in this way. And if you actually do single rotations instead of what they have suggested with, your height of the tree would not have changed much. Okay. Um, so the, the analysis of splaying is still, you know, incomplete. There are a lot of questions around what sort of operations will result in logarithmic behavior and many other questions are still being explored. But another good thing about splay trees is that not only that they have an amortized logarithmic behavior, but if your accesses are somehow skewed in the sense that you might be accessing some element many times, let's say, you have a certain distribution of accesses, then it adapts to this distribution. So in particular, let's say if fi is the sequence of accessing the ith element, then the total cost of these m accesses, where m is summation fi, turns out to be related to the entropy of this distribution. So it's fi times log m over fi. Okay? And this is nice. And you know, in in practice, Typically, when you access an element, you end up accessing, you know, and I think, for example, your uh, phone directory in your telephone are using splay trees because you go to a different location, suddenly you start calling a number, and you will realize that in the log, these numbers will come up to the top of the list. Okay? So, whenever you have a skewness in the distribution, then the splay trees actually perform much better than just having a logarithmic behavior. And this is not knowing this distribution, right? So, so you, you do this access, do this play, keep doing this, and somehow the running time depends on you know, the entropy of the distribution, even if you don't know this distribution. If you know the distribution, if you know the FIs, so this is, this is called the static optimal um, theorem of Slater and Tarjan. If you know their frequencies, then there is a standard dynamic programming algorithm which can actually build this nice optimum tree. So if I, if I tell you that not all elements are accessed equally likely, but some elements are accessed more often than not, if you know the frequencies, what would be the get best optim binary search tree which minimizes the access cost? You know, you know, standard example in dynamic programming. So, you know, it's there in Karman and Knuth had an n-square algorithm. The naive algorithm would be like an n-cubed, but uh, there's an n-square algorithm to do it. But the beauty of 
splay trees is that even without knowing this frequency, somehow it automatically uh, achieves the entropy of the cost. Okay, um, let me end with this dynamic optimality conjecture, which is that, so you know, now you consider a binary search tree and allow your algorithm after performing an access to do anything it wants, you know, it can do any kind of rotations, but I'm going to charge the number of rotations as the cost of the access, okay? So the binary search tree comes up with this sequence of accesses. After accessing, you're allowed to do anything you want, do rotations, because you might know the future, you know who's going to be accessed later, and so you might move certain guys towards the root, but I'll charge you the number of rotations, and this is a, a sort of a self-adjusting heuristic. Then their conjecture is that splay trees are as good as any other self-adjusting heuristic in terms of the total cost of accessing any sequence of operations. And this is still open. Um, there are some evidences. Tarjan himself wrote a paper later about if I have this kind of sequence of accesses, then you can do it in linear time. Yeah. And, and they also proved a list version of it earlier, so that was also a motivation for this theorem. Um, so let me just end with mentioning this list version. So consider so you want to organize a list of elements, and I tell you that ith element costs time i to access it, because it's sort of a linked list. And you're allowed to organize the list the way you want. And I tell you what is the frequency at which these elements are accessed, okay? Then what would be the natural way to organize it to minimize cost? Okay, so I have a sequence of elements. And if you put an element at the ith location, it costs i, okay? And I tell you what is the frequency by which every element is accessed. Now I want to minimize the cost of this total sequence of operations. Okay, so natural order would be hmm? decreasing order of the frequencies. Yes, yes. And so the total cost would be summation f i times i if, if f i is the decreasing sequence of the frequencies. Now, just like you had this heuristic. Uh, self-adjusting heuristic in binary search tree, you can do it on a list as well that after accessing an element, you're allowed to move things up to that, whatever you've scanned, knowing the future, and I will charge you for the number of swaps you've done. Then, Slater and Tarjan came up with this, actually they didn't come up with this, move to front heuristic was very well known by that time. You know, people were looking at Whenever I access an element, you know, this is this notion of caching or in, um, in practice, where whenever I access an element, I bring it to the front, and somehow that seems to work very well in practice. And they showed that using their amortized analysis and potential argument, in fact, uh, we, we proved this in our course on algorithms, you know, half a lecture, where they showed that, that if you do this move to front heuristic, then this is at most twice the cost of any other heuristic for a list, okay? So this is the, in some sense, the motivation for their conjecture on splay trees, where you want to do the same thing on trees, where they were conjecturing that the splaying operation is competitive, you know. When you say as good as, meaning it is, the cost is at most some constant time the cost of any other heuristic. Okay, so this um, is an important, this along with understanding splaying itself is one of the important, I would say, you know, open directions, current active research in uh, data structures. And uh, would, I think I would stop there. Yes, so that's, thank you. So any questions?
I would like to thank Professor Inktesh Raman for uh, accepting to give this talk. So he, he he's giving a second talk in this series. Uh, I really uh, thank for his time, time taken to prepare all these things. And uh, I had the good fortune to meet uh, Robert Tarjan during this uh, ACM India annual event. Uh, so <laughs> although I was not uh, intelligent enough to ask any questions in algorithm, so it was very exciting for me to meet him there and then talk about a few things. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you.